going to be talking about tribes and territories. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the original book uh, published in 1989 by uh, Tony Beecher. And Tony and I, the late Tony Beecher, who sadly, sadly is not among us anymore, uh, Tony and I worked on a second edition um, published in uh, 2001. Uh, and uh, as Karen just said, the third edition uh, is, uh, or the third take on it uh, is going to uh, be coming out shortly. And there are uh, people in the room who've contributed uh, to that and some excellent contributions uh, from the Australian, uh, the Australian perspective uh, will uh, add a huge quality to that. By the way, I was a bit sad not to get a jingle when I walked on. <laughs> I've, I've been spending the last 24 hours thinking what it might be. <laughs> I don't know why that's, that's gone off the agenda. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> um, what I'm not, there's, a, there's a sort of gap in the talk today, and that's about uh, interdiscipl interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity and so on. Um, the shift from mode one to mode two, if you like. I'm not going to be talking about, about that uh, because I did want to just concentrate on disciplines, but I do acknowledge that that's a huge uh, area and it's also one that could uh, seriously benefit from some critical thinking, but I'm not going to do that, though you may want to uh, ask me about that uh, either now or tonight at one o'clock in the bar. <laughs> what kind of uh, answers you'll get, of course, is uh, quite, different, uh, quite uh, unpredictable. <laughs> Now, the first edition of Tribes and Territories uh, looked at um, academic disciplines, the territories, and then at the cultures of, uh, of academics, uh, the, the so-called tribes, uh, and basically took an epistemological essentialist uh, position. Big phrase, what does it mean? That basically the knowledge structures of disciplines uh, conditioned or even determined the practices of academics. And that was based on um, a research design that looked at elite members of uh, elite universities and elite disciplines in the United States and the UK. And the argument was uh, that there would be a trickle down effect. So we look at, Tony Beecher looked at those um, and what is happening at uh, Stanford or Yale or whatever uh, today will happen in a community college somewhere else tomorrow. Well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, context is really uh, important. What that also meant, of course, was that uh, he tended to look at males, uh, male academics, um, and, uh, as I say, particular disciplines and people at the top of the field and research. So teaching and learning and other, other dimensions of academic practices were missing. So in the second edition, what I tried to do was to inject uh, some uh, thinking about disciplines and learning and teaching. And, of course, there's, there's quite a literature on that, and I was, I was taking, uh, taking the literature um, uh, rather than new empirical research. Uh, but I was unhappy, really, with the whole notion of tribes and territories. And I was having to fit in to uh, a framework that I really didn't agree with. Uh, so there was always the third book in, in prospect, um, and, and this, will be the, this will be the one. And what I want to do is to share with you um, some of the ideas from that book, uh, both in terms of theoretical development and in terms of things that have happened in the world of higher education and more broadly. Um, Anne Austin was talking about uh, the factors that have influenced us, changing information technology and, and so on and so forth yesterday. And uh, those forces, I think, are really important. Kerry Lee, in, in the new book, talks about vectors uh, of change that are influencing uh, practices. So I want to think, of, first of all, about some... Um, new ways of, of conceptualizing disciplines. To think about social practice theory, I'm taking a social practice approach. The three books that Karen kindly mentioned are all based on a social practice theoretical uh, perspective. 
Um, then think about some of the, the vectors of change that have influenced uh, practices and then consider some of the implications of those things for uh, our attempts to enhance uh, practices, learning and teaching practices and so on in universities. One final thing that was missing from the first two editions was thinking about non-academic staff. Uh, the, the focus was very much on the academic uh, tribes, but as Celia Whitchurch and, and several others have shown us in their work, actually the, what's happening is that we're getting more and more blended professionals and uh, I should have thought of mode three. Mode one, mode two, what could be next? <laughs> Gary Rhodes uh, in the States talks about mode three and by that he means that the teaching and learning enterprise is actually a multi-professional enterprise. It's not just about the academic and the students in the classroom anymore. Uh, it's much uh, broader than that. So when I'm talking about social practices and the influence of disciplines or not, on social practices. I'm really talking about uh, those uh, things that happen within higher education um, to do with the production, reproduction and dissemination of, um, of knowledge. And I think if you look at uh, a lot of the literature, what you see is a, is a kind of purist view, oops, going the wrong way, there we go, a purist view of understanding disciplines uh, that academic, academic practices are kind of in a, in a bubble, rather bounded uh, and unsullied. What we do in universities is unsullied by politics, by power and by organizational hierarchies and so on. And that's less and less actually the case uh, nowadays. So that's one thing, to try to pop that bubble. And also to think about disciplines and their influences in, on, in different kinds of practices in terms of recontextualization that how disciplines are articulated depends on the context. Basil Bernstein talks about recontextualization, recontextualization rules and so on. And when, he, when he's talking about that, he's talking about the shift from what he calls discipline as research to discipline as curriculum. In other words, that the, what the discipline is, is changed uh, by, by, uh, by, uh, by people uh, as they articulate it in different contexts, so when they're teaching it, when they're, when they're uh, you know, putting it into textbooks and so on. And I think it's possible to extend that into other areas. How is discipline articulated, for example, in uh, committee meetings? How do people use their discipline uh, in, in that kind of area? And what does that mean for the other people who are present in those different uh, contexts? So the notion of discipline as... I think can be extended to a whole range of uh, social practices uh, within universities. So finally, I think we need to pop the bubble of thinking about universities as closed systems. Um, Alverson, Mats Alverson at Lund University talks about universities as having multiple cultural configurations, uh, not being uh, just one, having one culture and so on. And really what he means by that is that clusters of practices if you want activity systems or communities of practice, operate uh, within, uh, largely within departments and generate uh, new cultures, different cultures and so on uh, within that in a very dynamic, in a very, very dynamic way. So um, moving on then, let's see if I can go the right way. So you've got that traditional picture of the tribes and the territories. One of the things about tribes, of course, is the notion of tribes is it's rooted in a colonial tradition, as Catherine Manathunga, who's here with us, points out in her chapter. Uh, it, it's a very problematic term uh, in terms of its, its heritage, and I think one, uh, one thing that we need to do is to, uh, is to, is to challenge that. Um, so in some of the literature, uh, we get... Uh, different definitions of discipline. And here's one from uh, Janet Donald. The question is, what is a discipline, actually? It's a more complicated thing than you might think. And this is a kind of traditional sort of definition of discipline. It's very similar to one I found by Peter Berger back in 1970. The problem with this, I'll give you a second just to think about it, the problems with this, are, uh, for me, that it concentrates on the, uh, on the knowledge uh, side of it only. Um, it assumes that 
it's a fairly static thing, and actually disciplines are really quite dynamic um, in, in, uh, in their character. And it doesn't really recognize the internal disputes and differences that go on uh, within disciplines. And, you know, those kind of turf wars, uh, paradigm wars, they're sometimes called within disciplines, are really uh, quite important. So some of the thinking about, uh, about disciplines has taken a rather static, a static view. The other thing, and perhaps the more important thing, is it doesn't recognize the fact that disciplines are instantiated in departments, in universities, and the power plays that go on, uh, the, the, the social construction of reality uh, that goes on uh, there affect how they are articulated um, in, uh, in universities. So you've got this, traditionally, you've got this view of, of disciplines as fairly static, and often, and I've, hear, I've heard this at the conference as well, views about disciplines like this, and again I'm quoting from Janet Donald, but you find this in the literature quite a lot. These people do this, those people do that. <laughs> kind of uh, almost a stereotyping view. In the original book there was a gallery of stereotypes that uh, Tony Beecher put in, uh, which I, I quickly excised. I think if disciplines were, uh, were really tribes or ethnic groups, we'd probably be all be guilty of racism. Uh, because we're stereotyping their uh, behaviors. And actually, if you talk to people within disciplines, uh, there are lots of different practices going, going on. So if you read quite a famous article by Ruth Newman and others about disciplines and learning and teaching practices, you get a view that uh, you know, uh, certain sorts of assessments, certain sorts of uh, teaching practices go on within uh, particular disciplines. Well, I don't think that's... Uh, that's uh, particularly fair. So, for example, they say academics in soft applied disciplines, that's things like social work, are open to collaborative teaching uh, and uh, in hard applied uh, fields, uh, something like engineering, they have a concern for comprehensive coverage of theory and acquisition of practical skills. But I think that's far from always true. Burton Clark uh, in 87 said that um, the characteristics imported into the academic profession by individual members from their personal background and prior experiences are the least important component of academic culture. A strong epistemological essentialist position that who we are, where we come from, our backgrounds and so on have very little or nothing to do with the practices we, uh, we articulate in universities. Well, again, I don't think uh, that's true. There is some more recent literature that uh, helps us to get a bit real about uh, discipline. So, for example, Weingart and Stair in 2000 say that disciplines are not only intellectual but also social structures, organizations made up of human beings with vested interests based on time investments, acquired reputations, and established networks that shape and, bi and bias their views on the relative importance of their knowledge. Disciplines are diffuse types of social organization for the production of particular types of knowledge. So we're beginning to see uh, real acknowledgement of social, social practices and power plays and so on, the influence of disciplines as a real social, uh, social thing going on. So Turner, too, uh, sees them as socially constructed by people in, in, in particular areas. We shouldn't get too carried away by that, though, there's a, quite a literature by uh, Michael Young and others um, saying that we should beware of moving too far to see disciplines simply as the, a voice. You know, a discipline is whatever we say it is, that there are narratives about disciplines. They take a critical realist uh, or a social realist uh, uh, perspective uh, saying that actually knowledge differences are important but overlaid by by social, uh, social uh, discussion, uh, social creation, I should say. So um, a changing, uh, moving field then uh, in terms of trying to think about disciplines and their significance. And I just want to move on quickly to think about a social practice perspective. And I won't get too heavily theoretical uh, about that. Uh, but 
I think if you bring a practice perspective to thinking about uh, disciplines, uh, it does begin to help you to think about the realities. It helps us to get a bit real about what's, what's happening in, in universities. So I've mentioned already the importance of context, university context and even departmental context that disciplines are, are articulated in different ways in, in different departments. Um, that uh, individual members of a discipline are drawing on uh, reservoirs of behavior, practices, sets of emotions, um, and so on, that uh, are, if you like, standard, but within a uh, particular context, those are recreated, different rules, recognition rules and recontextualization rules, as Bernstein says, helps to translate uh, the discipline into, into a particular uh, articulation. So we see people as carriers of practices, but at the same time, they're not social dopes. They, they are creating, they're acting agentically as well, developing unique sets of behaviors, and then you get this multiple cultural configuration. There are sets of practice clusters, committee work, developing a new program, uh, working on a research project, uh, etc., where disciplines are uh, articulated in, in different ways or recontextualized, if you like. And in that, tools or uh, mediating artifacts are used. So, for example, in teaching, the bedside rounds in medicine, the crit in the studio, in art and design, uh, and so on. And from a practice perspective, and, in, and particularly in thinking about change and the enhancement of um, learning and teaching, for example, the mediating artifacts are really important because through them you can help bring about a shift in recurrent practices. So, for example, by changing pro formas, uh, by changing the, 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 the technology, by thinking about the surveys that you're using, uh, for example, engagement surveys and so on, uh, or the, uh, the, the um, questionnaires that universities have to fill in uh, each year, you're actually shifting uh, practices. There's an interrelationship between the tool, tool use and, uh, and, and practices on the ground that goes on. Uh, so there's a configuring of activity, but also a sort of shaping of the, how the tools are used as well. I mentioned at the panel discussion another feature of uh, a social practice approach, which is discourse, the importance of discourse. And from this perspective, the use of discourse both articulates the world and can shape the world, can bracket out particular ways of seeing the world uh, and can um, shift particular things uh, to the forefront. So the way we talk about learning and teaching, the, the, the word deliver, for ex just to take an example, the word deliver, deliver the curriculum, de deliver the syllabus, that metaphor has particular connotations about knowledge <laughs> uh, and the transmission of knowledge and so on. And we tend not to think about that. And as I said earlier on, it is really important to uh, confront uh, the discourse that we're using and to just consider now and then uh, how important it is and what it's actually doing for the way we think about the world. And then uh, identity, subjectivities. There's a big debate in things like communities of practice theory activity theory and so on about uh, the significance of the individual uh, within the social world, within the work group that, that they're in. There's something called the uh, inseparability thesis, which says basically that we're a product of, of, um, of our context. Well, I don't think that's right, and I'll be showing you a little video. I'm going to stop talking in a second, but I'll show you some videos. I don't think that's right. Um, actually there's a relationship going on between context and, and individuality. And the final thing I wanted to talk about was uh, power. Um, and that's often missing from all of this, but I've hinted already that power plays, power of different types uh, is really quite important in how, how disciplines are articulated, both kind of brute power, uh, state power if you like, and interpersonal power uh, that, uh, that um, goes on on a, on a moment-by-moment moment basis. So to sum up then, uh, I'd say that disciplines aren't things. Um, this is one of the videos that's going to come up in a second. 
they uh, shift, change according to context and are dynamic. And we ought to think of them in terms of uh, contextualization, recontextualization uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of disciplines. And therefore, they have different sets of, uh, different extent of power, uh, different extent of influence over social practices. I don't think it's possible, actually, to say that they're strong or weak in a, in a general sense. Um, rather, they, uh, they shift and change according to context and according to distribution rules, recontextualization rules, and, and evaluative rules. Okay, I, I'm going to show you these four uh, videos. These are actors, they're not, the, uh, they're not the, the actual interviewees, but they are speaking transcripts uh, from uh, interviews that I conducted in South Africa in a merged, newly merged institution. Uh, between, and the merger was between historically advantaged white institution, uh, historically disadvantaged black institution, an Indian institution, and a, a, a very particular um, uh, specialist institution. So the idea was to uh, find uh, or improve uh, the, the quality f across all four institutions. But what I was interested in was studying how they were uh, managing to merge the disciplines. So you'd have two or three departments of law, for example, two or three departments of social work, and they were having to come together for the first time, talk about what they each did, and also try to establish a common curriculum. Uh, the Vice Chancellor said that there should be a common curriculum. So my interest really in this was uh, how has the discipline been articulated in these very different contexts? Are there similarities and so on? And what actually happens when they have to come together and, uh, and, and try to negotiate a common curriculum? So the first one that I want to show you is uh, somebody in the uh, department, one of the, one of the departments in law that I interviewed. And this really is about the different forms of power that went on as that uh, negotiation went forward. We on campus Z had a very real interest in trying to work out what would be the best for us in terms of location out of the three law teaching campuses. We were desperate not to be moved to law in campus X and, or law in campus Y and wanted to retain their location. We persuaded the university to let us stay with campus X moving to us voluntarily. This was for a number of reasons. We argued strongly that we had branded our degree. We sold ourselves as the Campus Z School of Law. We love our historical buildings. Uh, before the merger was announced, we brought in an architectural consultant so as not to deface the historical building and built in a new library. It, it's absolutely amazing. It's a lovely library. It's really lovely. So we were desperate to stay here. If we could swing it, we, we would try. I think they had an advantage in that Campus X had very few resources, very limited library facilities in particular, and we had all the access to databases and online stuff. Once the merger was formalised, we were keen to get together and renegotiate the curriculum. Again, we were keen to go ahead. We would push ahead and there was no going back. We had a joint intake of students one year ahead of everyone else to show the university that we were serious about staying on our campus. I think back to how we came to persuade them, it, it was about people, persuasive personalities taking the initiative. In truth, we had sway of numbers. So when we said, look, we got the great course of first year level and we did our homework in advance, it was very hard for Campus X to argue against it. However, in discussing the curriculum in part two with the other campuses, it was tinkering because the Law Society largely determines the curriculum. But there were a number of strong personalities in our department who really pushed their particular teaching interest and research interest. To give an example, we have a person who's on the Human Rights Commission. So in our degree, human rights is very strongly emphasised. It's weighted in favour of administrative law, constitutional law and human rights. So that our flagship, our distinctive feature, and before the meeting we said we are not giving up on that. That's what we're good at. That's what we made our name on. Uh, we also felt we had an image market-wise, reputation-wise. We definitely believed we had the better course and we had weight of numbers, so we went in in a strong position. You had your criminal lawyers, you had your family lawyers, you had your people who clearly saw it as their territory, trying to persuade everybody else. 
It was power plays, horse trading. We will give you this if you give us that. Usually, one dominant player took the lead. There are individual personalities, powerful personalities, strong players, who feel they own their specialisms and tend to dominate. They are going to sweet, squeeze out specialists who are less able to make their case. Coming from a position of authority, they came in and laid it down. We've always done it like this and intimidated people. And if you analyse that, you can see different forms of power being spoken about and, and, uh, and, and operated. So, you know, to go back to what I was saying earlier on about the definition of disciplines and the understanding of disciplines, it's not in a, in a bubble, a bounded bubble, but it's actually, you know, we need to get real, uh, as obviously happened there, uh, about how we, how we understand uh, decisions about what, what the discipline is, what's important, and so on. The second one is about uh, ideology to some extent and uh, really about the ideology of, of, of merit and intelligence uh, and so on. And I think you can see issues about context uh, being played out in this one too. We had a member of staff, a theoretical physicist, who when he came here said, standards are the key thing, we should select our students and leave them to sink or swim. I'm the only person around here who's maintaining standards and I shall maintain standards. He came from an American situation and had to have the difficulties of certain groups of students in South Africa pointed out to him. Once he realised this, he changed his position. We looked through our materials, our workbooks. We found examples about the conduction of heat through the walls of an igloo. Many of our black students didn't know what an igloo was. We even got to the point of talking about the processes in the photographic plate in a camera. We eradicated these culturally based examples. Has there been a transformation in physics teaching? Decidedly, yes. So uh, I was just going to thank her then. <laughs> it's a video. <laughs> um, yeah, so ideology and, uh, and, and context are uh, really important there, I think. You might want to come back to some of these, these examples uh, later on. Um, clearly, I'm just pick, I've just, what I've done is just picked out what I thought were illustrative things that you know, were found elsewhere as well. The third one um, is also about context and about stereotyping. Um, and well, I'll, I'll, this again is a, a, a different a discipline um, and, a, and a different interviewee, but I'll, I'll just let you listen to it. As we merged, the first thing that became apparent was that UniWide didn't have the same academic standards and the same regard for teaching as we did. The idea was that we would form one big school of chemistry across all the campuses. The heads of chemistry met together to discuss the merger, but it quickly became apparent that no one understood what anyone else was doing. So, even between UniX and College Z, there was a cultural difference. And then we had the UniY scenario, where they were miles behind us. And the biggest problem we had was how do you tell somebody that they're not very good? When you have different institutions with different academic cultures, it's very hard for people to believe that they're not the ones doing the best job. We have a strong culture of teaching and learning. But University Y, to tell you the truth, had no culture at all. However, they have now adopted most of our courses, but that was hard work. So now we've got a common curriculum in chemistry, which is very, very learner-based. One of the best things we've done is the optional Saturday morning tutorials. I go along with some PhD and MA students and give extra help to the kids working through workbooks. The staff in UniY said, if we did that, our students wouldn't come because our students are very different from your students. And that's been the big thing with the merger. Everybody thinks they and their students are different. Okay. Again, well, you know, I don't need to say anything really, do I? I'll leave it to you to uh, interpret that. Um, Okay, final one, just to move on quite quickly. I mentioned the inseparability thesis in some of the work on social practice theory, which I disagreed with. And I, I think this quote uh, describing the influence of one particular person just shows how 
even within our community of practice and activity system, whatever you want to call it, uh, one person brings in from outside not only their history and so on, but also their, their personal characteristics. So, uh, you know, the influence of humans, individual people, uh, is, is really significant. And that's something we found in our evaluation studies as well. If one person changes a, a, key, a key player, it can have enormous consequences uh, for the success or otherwise of the, of the innovation. So if we could play this one. The thing is, in any merger situation, you have the philosophical issues and you've got the personalities. I mean, we have this Lulu of a personality, I mean, I'm telling you. I don't think I'm exaggerating. Um, you know, when I say, well, basically, it was like a little Hitler. And, um, well, I mean, he was in charge of physics and chemistry. But, I mean, he was just, I, honestly, he was just so obstructionist. I mean, the political, I mean, uh, the politics, I mean, the chemists, well, they just, I mean, they just, like, couldn't get on with him. And, I mean, we had several of them who left. Um, anyway, we found this out in one of the first few meetings with him. I mean, he was arch commonality man. Oh, yes. I mean, we must have common tests. We must have a common curriculum. It was common everything. And anyone who didn't believe in his philosophy, well, if you didn't agree with him, you had to, I mean, you had to be reported. I mean, he was so authoritarian with his staff, and I mean, that meant they couldn't discuss the common curriculum freely with us. I mean, I said, do you know what this attempt to standardise means logistically? I mean, do you know what it means to people's autonomy to teach what they want? I mean, he just didn't seem to, I don't know. So when we came to working out the common curriculum physics, I mean, it wasn't academically based with careful analysis of our country's needs and the trends, I mean, students' needs, the nature of physics. I mean, it was personality-based, the cut and thrust of the personality. <laughs> I bet you've never come across anybody like that in your <laughs> professional life. The, I said they were actors, actually, they're just people from my department that kindly agreed to uh, do that. But they're damn good, aren't they? <laughs> okay, well, I hope those videos kind of concretized a bit some of the rather theoretical uh, ideas that I was articulating. Um, you get the message, you know, let's get a bit real. Let's pop the bubble of thinking about disciplines and really think about how those are instantiated in... Uh, committee meetings and so on and so forth and that's of significance not just for uh, academic staff disciplinary specialists but of everybody who's engaged in academic practices in university so just uh, uh, very quickly I just wanted to say that also as well as that sort of re theorizing of practices in universities of course as Anne uh, was saying uh, yesterday, huge things have happened in the real world, these enormous changes, these factors uh, that, have, uh, that have been occurring uh, that have that also influence um, what happens in, in universities. Is it possible to say that the, the relevance, the significance, the power of disciplines is declining on average? Well, as I said before, context is so important, so it's really hard to uh, say uh, gen to make general statements like that but I suppose it, on average overall yes these other forces are, are really important uh, in the chapter that, where she deals with these things Kerry Lee talks about vectors as I mentioned change vectors uh, and identifies uh, demographic changes in the population technological changes of course market forces the aging academic work workforce and the quality and performativity agenda the sort of new managerialism that I was referring to earlier on those are all really really significant and of course one could identify other ones as well Stephen Ball talks about a global policy ensemble um, by which he means a sort of neoliberal, new managerialist set of policy drivers that you see pretty much all around the world. And a lot of what I've been hearing about Australia is not unfamiliar to me at all. Uh, and, you know, that's much the same in many, many other countries. And those are driving practices. We're jumping to, uh, to new, um, 
new forces, new, new agendas, and so on. And I, I, obviously, I don't need to say any more about that. Uh, you're very familiar uh, uh, with those. So uh, just to come to the final part of the, of the talk then, um, what does this mean for change? What does all this mean for trying to change things? I don't think, you know, what I've been trying to do is to set out a theory of stasis, if you like. What's it like? How important are disciplines? How is their significance changing? And how should we re-theorize that? Um, okay, you've got a theory of stasis. What about change then? Well, I think there's a, a, a few things that we can say. One is that practices are engrooved and they do tend to snap back to um, previous practices. I haven't really got time to illustrate that, but it's really hard actually to keep the movement uh, going. One of the things that we can do in that, as I've said already, is to think about the tools that we use, the artifacts, the mediating artifacts, think about proformers and, and so on. We need to think about uh, the uh, emotions and, 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 and codes of signification, the kind of you know, associations we have. That making a change, for example, to peer assessment, the student peer assessment, isn't just a technical change, it actually has an emotional resonance with teachers, asking people to stop being the sage on the stage and to be the, the, uh, the guide at the side. Actually, you know, has issues about identity and why they're there, power, uh, and so on. They're not just technical changes. I've mentioned the importance of discourse and how, how potential changes are framed and not to make the mistake of calling uh, you know, administrative staff units of resource and, and that sort of thing uh, and not even to think like that. The importance of subjectivities and power and how people will respond to potential changes. The significance of being anthropologically familiar with context. If, if you take the social practice uh, point that context is significant, very significant, and that things are usually contextually contingent, for example the articulation of disciplines or particular social practices, then change agents somewhere along the line, somebody needs to be anthropologically familiar with the, with the context. And uh, we use, Tony Beecher and I use in the book this notion of using a market gardening approach rather than an agribusiness approach, in other words, being uh, aware of, of, of context. And to expect what's sometimes called domestication, in other words, when an initiative hits a particular context, it's changed, it's domesticated, it's made to fit, and that means that there will be different outcomes to the same initiative in, in different uh, locales. So there's a sort of sensitivity to, uh, to change uh, and, and uh, the importance of current practices that's really important. And I often talk about three important characteristics when thinking about change salience, congruence, and profitability. The salience of whatever initiative it is that you're trying to bring about for the people that you're aiming at, uh, how significant it is for it. Congruence, how, how the projected new practices fit with the current ones, um, and starting from where people are is a, is a really important uh, thing to do. And profitability, not in the cash sense, you know, we, we get so little of that as individuals in uh, academia, uh, but in the sense of things that matter to people. Why should this change be, why should I do this change? Why will it make my life better? And for people in universities, time actually is the currency that's uh, of importance. So showing people uh, that uh, uh, time can be saved and yet the, 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 the practice can be done more efficiently, more effectively um, and, and better. Uh, is really important. So thinking about the, the initiative, the change initiative, thinking about context uh, and thinking about how the two things uh, fit together are uh, really important. So uh, just to uh, sum up then, I think we do need uh, new metaphors. Just give you a moment to <laughs> appreciate that. I don't know if you can see the things on the boxes there. And as uh, Catherine Manathunga and uh, Angela Bruce say in their chapter, uh, we, 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 need to, we definitely move, need to move away from uh, these tribal and territorial metaphors. And what they're suggesting, I think rightly, because it's been in my mind as well, I've tried to use it, 
is uh, metaphors around liquid, liquidity, uh, oceans, rivers, uh, and so on. Liquid modernity, Bauman talks about. Uh, so, um, movement, flow, uh, and dynamism, rather than the staid, stable, static concepts of tribes and territories. And I'll leave it there to give time for questions. Thank you so much, Paul. I'll say a few words in a minute, but uh, we do have some time for questions. Thanks so much. And uh, happy to take questions from the floor. Yes? Gordon, speak up. The last, the last slide brought to my mind notions of complexity uh, in the context of change, notions of agency, um, emergence, unpredictability, um, agents operating according to their own rules and so on. Could you comment on the relationship between your thinking as expressed there and any influences that complexity theory has had <laughs> on that? Well, uh, Lynette Arthur, I don't know if she's here, gave a very interesting talk about merging mergers and complexity theory and applied uh, complexity theory uh, to that in a very interesting way. So perhaps have a chat with Lynette. I'm not enamored of complexity theory personally, um, only as a metaphor. Uh, my own, it's a while since I looked at it, I have to admit, but I did spend uh, quite some time reading around that literature and really came to the conclusion that as a metaphor, it works okay, but that one shouldn't try to go too far down applying uh, the uh, physical and biological notions of complexity theory about birds in flight and so on and so forth uh, to the social world. It's a bit dangerous. Any other questions? Yes. I wondered, in terms of the way you're thinking about disciplines and the fluidity and permeability of them, how you see the process of socialization or enculturation into particular professional areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Peter Knight, and thank you for that. Peter Knight and I, uh, the late Peter Knight, I'm very sorry to say, somebody said to me the other day, all of your collaborators die. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't uh, yeah, bear that in mind if you fancy writing with me. <laughs> Uh, but, um, no, Peter Knight and I did uh, a study in, based in Canada and, and the UK uh, of uh, new uh, members of academic staff because we were really interested in, in that question. Uh, it, 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 we thought it would help us to understand the notions of cultures and so on if we could understand a bit better how new academic staff um, you know, are enculturated into... Uh, particular contexts and particular disciplines and so on. We couldn't actually find any new academic staff, uh, so uh, we, we, got some, we, <laughs> we got some partly used ones and they, they were okay. Um, we, we interviewed them, uh, Peter was in Canada, I was in the UK, and we interviewed them in different institutions and so on, and then it re-interviewed by telephone, some of them, later on. And the, the results are published in a series of four articles that you can have a look at if, you, if you're interested. But, um, yeah, I mean, what we found was that uh, happenstance, serendipity, if you like, was really important in that. The overheard conversations, I'm thinking about things about teaching and learning, particularly in that, particularly in that discipline. Um, so, uh, you know, formal workshops and so on were important, uh, but only for some forms of knowing. Um, Frank Blackler has a very interesting article about forms of knowledgeability, uh, embodied knowledge and brain knowledge and so on. And actually, if you begin to think in those terms and think about the kinds of uh, uh, levels of appropriateness of different ways of transmitting knowing, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to do. But we certainly found that serendipity was really quite significant in the socialization process in, in particular contexts. And so we began to think about beyond serendipity. In other words, how do you uh, create context that can allow those things to happen which are natural but a bit random um, in, in better ways to scaffold them, in other words. One more question. Margaret, universities here but presumably other places are increasingly using teaching focused or teaching only appointments. Um, and 
many of these people are being pressed by their institutions then into doing research, into teaching and learning. I'm just wondering, and, and they often become sort of homeless, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and I mean, one can foresee that perhaps in 10 years' time, these people, without the infrastructure to support them, will be out of touch yeah. with where their discipline or area or whatever is yeah. thinking. Yeah. I just wondered if you wanted to make any comment on that. Um, well, yes, to agree, really. I mean, certainly in the UK, uh, there was one university that said explicitly, the Vice-Chancellor said, we are a teaching-only university, and he had to retract that statement uh, because there was such an outcry. It had terrible consequences. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of opposition uh, to that within the university. So nobody in the UK, no, no university says they're teaching only, although some will say that they're, you know, a teaching-focused university. And, and so on. And that, that kind of issue is a very political issue, of course, because it brings funding or you know, takes funding away. And that's why there's been so much interest in the teaching research nexus, uh, a lot of literature on that. And really, there's a political agenda behind that, of course, to say, you know, teaching and research mutually instantiate each other uh, and reinforce each other and so on. That's certainly what I found in, in the literature, much of which is, you know, a bit normative, uh, to be honest. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the effects of the research assessment exercise and now the research excellence framework in the UK will have been to some extent, but will certainly be much more in the future to divide uh, staff in the way that you're talking about. And for my money, that's an incredibly del deleterious uh, thing to happen. Thank you for giving us both the, uh, the theoretical and the philosophical perspective, but also that practical one. And in particular, thank you for challenging us to think about new metaphors. Uh, higher education on the edge is one of them, and uh, managing that through uh, this metaphor of liquidity, I think, is, uh, is one really uh, opportune way to think about it. That's right, <laughs> waterfall over the edge. Well, we'll talk more about that tomorrow, so please join me in thanking Paul very much. <laughs>